Good morning, everyone. It is a joy and a privilege to be with you. Uh, if you weren't here, I was, I was here three weeks ago. Um, I'm one of the party boys, so the family out at Trails and Ranch that this church has faithfully supported for many years, uh, as long as I can remember anyway. And uh, it's just a joy to be able to come and to worship the Lord with you, to be together as the family of God, and to just celebrate who he is and what he's done, even in the partaking of communion. Um, he is good, and he is worthy. A year ago, February in 23, some of you may remember that uh, there was kind of an outbreak of worship that took place. Uh, there, there was a chapel service over in Asbury in Wilmore, Kentucky, and there's just some students who wanted to sit and to continue to worship after the chapel service had ended, after all the other students had gone to their classes, and it didn't take long before other students came back to the chapel and continued to worship and to continue to sing songs of praise and to lift their voice to the Lord. And it didn't take long for the world to notice. Only a few days later, there were tens of thousands of people who were beginning, beginning to filter through Asbury University, and their sole purpose for coming together was to come and see what God was up to, to come and see how he was moving and how he was being worshipped and what was happening in that place. And so I felt the urge to go. I, I felt that prompting from the Lord. I, I found myself just sitting in my office and praying, Lord, I, I want to go, but I'm looking at my schedule, and I don't see how I can make it happen. And I felt clear, clear as can be, the Holy Spirit just say, Jordan, you can go. And I was like, yeah, but I have, I have to do this, and I have to do this, and, and I have all of this going on. And on Saturday, I, I have this new thing over at the detention center that we're starting with the youth group, and, and there's all of this that I need to give attention to. And I, I felt the Lord say, Jordan, you can go. And, and I, I started looking at my schedule more carefully, and I realized there was about a 35-hour period of time that wasn't booked. And I was like, Lord, I can't drive there in that amount of time. And he said, call Adam. And Adam is a guy in our church who happens to own his own plane. And I was like, okay, well, this isn't going to work. So I called Adam. I said, Adam, would you, would you be interested in flying down to Wilmore, Kentucky with me on Thursday? And he said, to the revival thing? And I said, yeah. And he said, yeah, when do you want to go? <laughs> and I was like, okay, so this might be the Lord moving. And so it ended up being that we were able to, I was able to go with Adam, and we were able to grab one of our other deacons at the church, and we wanted to go down and see what the Lord was doing. And when we got there, we were just struck by the number of people who were there, the number of people who were coming from all over the world. We met people from Jamaica. We met people from Europe. We met people from all over the place. And as you kind of moved around, you could hear the different accents and languages that were being spoken. But then as you came in to that worship area, there was one voice. It, it was the body of Christ expressively singing out loud the praises of his name. And, and I remember standing there. It's an auditorium that holds about 1,500 people. And we were up on the upper balcony. And then there's the lower floor. And there's people standing all around the room. And everyone's just crying out to the Lord. Everyone's just singing praises to his name. And it's just going on and on and on. And I thought, man, what a beautiful image that the body of Christ is gathering from all over the world. They have nowhere else to go, nothing else to do. They're just here to worship the Lord. And it's something that we actually take for granted almost every Sunday. We forget that we are the family of God. That this group of people, this room, is a body of believers who's been established by Christ and who's been put in this community to reach the people in this area. Praise the Lord that God has placed you here. I am grateful for this church, and I'm grateful for the ways that the Lord pulls you together for his purposes, recognizing that it's all for him. It's not about the name of the church. It's not about the people in this room. It's about the Lord. And what he is about. And so today we're going to study from Psalm 129. And it's one of the Psalms of Ascent. And one of the beautiful things about the Psalms of Ascent is that these are the Psalms that we sing 
as they would travel to Jerusalem, as, as they would get ready to come to the major festivals, there were three of them each year, that the people of Israel would gather to come to. The family of God would come, and they had nowhere else to go. They had nothing else to do. They were there simply to worship God. And so this morning, we get to do that together. And I am grateful that we get to enter into this with one another. As we look at these Psalms of Ascent, before we get into this this morning, I want you to be aware of this. It's structured in a very intentional way. They're different authors, so it's not one author who compiled this and thought, this looks good. Rather, there's several people who compiled the order of these Psalms. And what we know is that throughout Israel's history, they've used these songs on their way to Jerusalem for the feast. And there's a specific order to them, that there's actually 15 psalms, and they are built in triads. So every time you make it through three psalms, you're going to start over in the type of tone and setting as to what's going on. And what you'll find in the first psalm of each triad is that it's always a form of lament. It's always a cry for God to intervene, that something has gone wrong, something is going wrong, and we need the Lord's hand to provide the second psalm is always one that is claiming the promises of God or starting to rejoice in that there's movement from that place of darkness that came in the psalm before. And then the third psalm is always one that just rejoices in who God is. It just praises and celebrates his name. Psalm 129 is the first psalm of the fourth triad, which means it's a psalm of lament. And, and what these patterns symbolize for us is that there's different seasons and contexts in life, and we never know which one's going to come next, but we're going to kind of live through some cyclical patterns in our life. And what this teaches us to do is how do we keep our gaze, how do we keep our focus on the Lord regardless of our context? Regardless of the distractions that we are facing, regardless of the trauma that we're experiencing, how do we turn to the Lord and be in his presence, seeking after him, pursuing him as the one who is worthy of all that we have, no matter what's happening around us? That's what we're entering into together today. So this is Psalm 129. If you would read it with me, it says, Greatly have they afflicted me from my youth. Let Israel now say, Greatly have they afflicted me from my youth, yet they have not prevailed against me. The plowers plowed upon my back. They made long their furrows. The Lord is righteous. He has cut the cords of the wicked. May all who hate Zion be put to shame and turned backwards. Let them be like grass on the housetops which withers before it grows up, with which the reaper does not fill his hand, nor the binder of sheaves his arms. Nor do those who pass by say, The blessing of the Lord be upon you. We bless you in the name of the Lord. You know, one of the, the breathtaking realities for Israel is the amount of affliction they've experienced as a people. Throughout history, what we see is that even their existence today is a remarkable feat of what they've overcome. It's a testimony to the Lord's provision in their life. And here's what I mean by this. Even if we go back to the time of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we see these are the founding fathers of the faith in so many respects. But it's Jacob's family who, in his old age, they move to Egypt, and they're still just a family. Sure, they're growing in number. They're not a people group yet, but it's in Egypt that they really multiply, that they turn into a people group, a nation that is claimed by God. But the problem is, it didn't take long after the death of Joseph for, for Joseph and his family to be forgotten. And then we're told that the new Pharaoh remembered them no more and made slaves of all of the Israelites. So what that tells us is from the very beginning, these people who have been claimed by God as his royal priesthood, his, his nation, that they're born into slavery. For 400 years, they're continuing to be born into slavery. And what's interesting about them is it's because of their following the one true king that there's this anti-Semitism, this hatred towards them. Throughout history, we see over and over and over that there are other nations, other peoples who are out to not just defeat the Israelites, but to wipe them out. 
We see it with uh, the Egyptians and their affliction, not necessarily that they're there to wipe them out, but that they're experiencing this ongoing slavery. We see it with the Philistines. We see it with the Syrians. We see it with the Assyrians, the Canaanites, the Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans. It just goes on and on and on. It's like a never-ending list of enemies who are coming against Israel again and again and again. And it's Warren Wiersbe who, in studying this, said, Israel has suffered more than any nation in history, yet Israel has not been destroyed. Why is that? You see, the Lord made a promise to the people of Israel that he would go before them, that he would multiply them, that they would know what it means to be his own people. Which means that Israelites can cling to this promise that though the tunnel might grow dark, though it might be damp and there's no sense of light at all, though they're stumbling through, they're they're stubbing their toes, they're hitting their heads on rocks, and they are struggling to move forward, they know they can press on because there's light somewhere at the end of this long, dark, damp tunnel that eventually the Lord is going to show himself to them. And it's going to be a form of mercy and grace that they can rejoice and they can celebrate and and they can claim this because God's promise is one of preservation, that he will be with them. But it's really hard when you're in the thick of it, when you're experiencing deep pain. You see, there's affliction that comes against us in different ways. In Israel's case, it was people who literally hated God and were against them because of it. And that's a type of affliction that very few of us, if any, have ever known. But we do experience pain. We do know what it's like to have people come against us. We have a sense of what affliction in this world is like. And we know that it's a result of being in a broken world. We've received pain from people all around us, whether it's incidentally or purposely. The other reality that we have to grapple with is we've also contributed to the pain that others have experienced. You see, the pain in our lives is a unique tool that the Lord uses. It, it has a way of shaping us. And it's, it's true for all of us that we have, to some degree, been shaped by our pain, but we also have socially been influenced by our pain. People who we don't trust because of the way that we've been stabbed in the back, because of the way that they've inflicted pain upon us. Have, have you ever considered why pain is so unique to the human experience? It has such influence over us. I mean... In our pain, we've all acted out of character from time to time. We have this increased sensitivity where we react strongly to even the slightest of perceived criticisms. We become agitated and irritable. We respond with abruptness and harsh tones. We have trust issues with people as we get betrayed. And sometimes we have trust issues with people who didn't even betray us, but because that person did a long time ago, now I fail to trust anyone the way that I should be able to. And what we find is ultimately in our pain, we we typically withdraw from settings. It's almost as if when significant pains come, we're willing to allow it to color our perspective. We're willing to allow it to have its way with us. Almost the binding power over us. But my question is, do we even realize that we're giving it that type of authority? Or is this something that we subtly fall into? So the question becomes, how should we respond to pain? And I think that's what our psalmist is trying to get at. Take a look at verses 1 and 2. He says, Greatly have they afflicted me from my youth. Let Israel now say, Greatly have they afflicted me from my youth, yet they have not prevailed against me. What we find is he's not running from the depth of the pain. He's not trying to pretend like it's not there. He's not trying to pretend like this is some easy thing that he's going to be able to navigate and to walk through. What he's saying is this wasn't just painful. This wasn't just affliction. This is something that knocked the people of Israel down in a fight. Greatly have they afflicted me. 
He's saying this is a penetrating type of pain that we didn't know how to handle. And he says, we've known it from our youth. This, this has been a fixed reality for us. It's ongoing in so many senses. And what we need to know about the timing of Psalm 129 is this is post-exilic from Babylon. So they've returned to Israel from Babylon, but now Persia is ruling over them. And so they're looking at this going, yeah, we're back in the land, but we're still slaves to these people. So as we, as we look at this, we, we really need to weigh, how are we pursuing the Lord in the midst of whatever's happening in our own lives? Because there can be seasons of life where we feel that we have a fixed reality of pain, that it's not going away. But have we allowed it to distract us in such a way that we're not focused on the Lord the way we ought to be? When I was with you three weeks ago, we were studying from Psalm 126, and, and we talked about this idea of looking back at how God has been faithful to us, celebrating the movements he's had in my life where I can look back and say, man, if it, if it wasn't for the Lord in that time, I don't know if I'd be here today. If it wasn't for the Lord working in my heart, I can, I can tell you personally, I know I wouldn't be a pastor I, I look back at all of the ways that the Lord has been faithful, and I think, thank you, Lord, for the way that you brought me through that. And thank you, Lord, for the way that you allowed that to happen in my life so that you could bring refinement that I didn't even know I needed. You see, it's this idea of looking back and recognizing what the Lord has done so that we can be emboldened by him, by the fact that he walks with us just as he walked with the Israelites that he gives us a promise as well. And so we can live out today more boldly. We can embrace who he is. We can turn towards him. We can have our gaze fixed on his person. And what it will do is it will embolden us to take the steps he's calling us to take tomorrow. And the reason why this is so important is we don't know what context tomorrow holds. And typically, our character is most revealed in times of suffering, in times of pain. And so maybe you're in a good season right now where you're celebrating and you're grateful and, and you're really thriving in life and you have family dynamics that you're just praising the Lord for. Amen. Praise God for that. But also know that suffering isn't far away. Affliction isn't far away. It, it doesn't matter what your context is today. Your response to your context today will always impact your tomorrow. Always. And this is why we have to make a habit of coming to the Lord again and again and again. Because when the choppy waters come, we need to have a habit of running to the Lord so that we don't get distracted and fall into some type of self-pity. But rather... Like the psalmist, we can say, in my affliction, in my pain, in, in what they have done to me, they have not prevailed against me. Meaning, for him, that there's been an appropriate response to the pain. Let's take a look at verses 3 and 4. It says, The plowers plowed upon my back. They made long their furrows. The Lord is righteous. He has cut the cords of the wicked. Now, before we move on, I want to consider for just a moment that verse 4 is the central hinge to the whole passage. What comes before it is able to be said because they know that God is righteous, and what comes after it, they're praying in their current context, because they, and they know they can pray that way because God is righteous. This psalm is built on the person of God and his righteousness. So let's, let's look at this, what he's saying in verse 3. The plowers plowed upon my back. They made long their furrows. Let's, let's consider what a plow does to a field. The, the spade goes underneath the ground. It takes everything that's underneath and it flips it on top of the surface so that the surface is totally buried. It kills all the roots. It kills all the plants. There's nothing left. It's a path of destruction for whatever is in that field. It kills everything. And the imagery that we get here is, is quite provocative. It's that the affliction 
that they've experienced as a people from, from the whips, from the lashes, from the work that's been demanded of them. It's as if the skin has died, that the whips have sunk deep into their backs from one end to the other. It has killed and destroyed what was there. He's trying to help us see that their suffering was of great significance and their wounds were incredibly deep. And yet, they made it through. They were able to persevere. They were not consumed by the present pain or the suffering that has been placed on them. And it's not because they overcame. It's not because of some type of internal fortitude. It's, it's not this volitional drive to overcome that they're able to step forward and say, wow, we made it through that, and pat themselves on the back. He comes to verse 4 and he says, it's because the Lord is righteous. It's because of his plan. It's because of his purposes. And not only that, the psalmist says in his specific case that the Lord has freed them from the pain. He has cut the cord of wickedness. And so there's this sense of praise, even though that there's been great suffering, praise God for the way that he has limited the affliction we've experienced because it could be far worse. What he's really doing here is he's showing that we don't have to be afraid of pain. We can accept pain. And the reason why we can accept it, the reason we don't have to try to run from it, the reason we don't have to try to pretend like everything's okay, the reason we don't have to resist it, and we can just say, yeah, this is true of my life, it's because God is righteous. It's because he's sovereign over all. And I don't have to be apathetic about my pain, right? I, I don't have to come to a place where I'm downplaying its effects in my life. And I certainly don't need to go around giving unnecessary emphasis to it. Where I draw unnecessary attention to the way that I'm suffering. No, he, the psalmist accepts the pain is a lot that has been given to him in his life. That though it hurts, God has reason and purpose for it. And he's going to use it to bring about something new. Secondly, the psalmist invites others who have been hurt to join him in accepting it. He doesn't want to leave anybody behind. He recognizes that other people are going through pain, that they are suffering, that their affliction is great. And we see it in verse 2 when he says, let Israel now say. He's calling everyone to come and to come to a place of healing and that healing is found before the throne of God. Because the third piece that he does here is he intentionally, deliberately turns to God. So he accepts it as lot in his life. He invites others into it so that they can experience healing too. And they together deliberately turn towards God. I will walk forward proclaiming that even in the midst of my harsh reality, God is righteous. That's what's happening in verse 4. Praise God in heaven because in his righteousness, he saw it fit to limit our affliction. That it only had a season. It only had a time. And then the Lord cut the cords and freed us from it. Millard Erickson is a theologian. And when he's talking about God's righteousness, he describes it this way. He says, righteousness is seen when God's holiness is applied to his relationship with other beings. The righteousness of God means, first of all, that the law of God, being a true expression of his very nature, is as perfect as he is. So what does this tell us about the person of God? That God's righteousness is perfect. There's no flaw. There's, there's no fault in him. And when we look at the law and we consider how broad and vast it is throughout all of the Old Testament, because that's the law that he's referring to. When, when we come to grasp all of Leviticus and Deuteronomy, all, all of the canon and, and, and what we're called to live out in, in that Old Testament time, it's, it's a significant law. 
It's one that is there to show we cannot measure up. And therefore, we have to have relationship with the Father. But that same law that we cannot measure up to, it's, it's not a law that God is striving to attain. It's, it's not one that he's like setting goals, trying to make sure, oh yeah, I can't forget to do this and to be this way. No, this, this comes out of his very nature. The law is an expression of who he is. This is simply how he functions, how he exists. So what that tells us is that in his righteousness, God has shown us in Incredible mercy and grace because we've all fallen short into sin. We've we've all chosen spiritual death over God out of our selfishness. Every single one of us falls short, but God is perfect. He's perfect in love. And because he's perfect in love, he sent Jesus to pay for our sin, to take our punishment and to place it on himself. And so when we talk about the cords of the wicked being cut free, we can have freedom today because of God's righteousness, because he sent Jesus as the perfect spotless lamb to die for us. You see, despite the pain and the struggles that we face in this life, we know that God is perfect in righteousness, that he does no wrong. He has not given more suffering than I deserve. It's just the opposite. I deserve far more. Now, this is where the psalmist pivots. You see, the people have learned to trust God in his righteousness. They have learned to claim this, to claim the promise of preservation, that he is with them, that they are his people who have been chosen, who have been set apart. And because of that reality, that learned reality through the suffering, they now enter into prayer in verses 5 through 7. Read this with me. It says, May all who hate Zion be put to shame and turned backwards. Let them be like grass on the housetops, which withers before it grows, with which the reaper does not fill his hand, nor the binder of sheaves his arms. Now, this is a imprecatory prayer, which in a literal sense means to pray against someone. And that's odd for us because it's Jesus who in Matthew 5.44 said, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Is this the type of prayer that Jesus was saying we should pray over them? No. You see, in precatory prayer, it's, it's our raw emotion. It's, it's that inward willingness to just share everything that's there, every thought, feeling, emotion with the Lord. It's often filled with anger. There's also this sense of self-justice involved. But imprecatory prayer is not about revenge. It's not about my sense of justice. It's not about God doing necessarily the things that I'm saying when I'm praying against someone. But when we study this imprecatory prayer throughout Scripture, and and we find several of them in the Psalms, what we find is it's a way for us to emotionally deal with the deepest parts that are unsettled, that are angry, that are frustrated, that are hurting, and to bring it to the Lord and to recognize that because he is perfect in righteousness, I can share this with him and I can trust him with the outcome. That he, in his righteousness, will do accordingly as he sees fit, according to his sense of perfect justice, instead of my sinful sense of justice. So when we look at this imprecatory prayer, we need to understand that the key to all of this is that It's meant to be left at the throne. It's not something that we continue to carry with us. It's something that we intentionally get out before the Lord and we leave at his feet and we say, Lord, would you take care of this? Would you speak into this? It's a recognition that I'm not perfect, 
that I shouldn't be the one to determine outcomes. But yet, Lord, I feel so strongly about this. And I know that I'm off somewhere in it. So would you take it? Now, when we consider imprecatory prayers, this is probably the least harsh imprecatory prayer, at least in the book of Psalms, that we find. Take a look at verse 5. It says, May all who hate Zion be put to shame and turned backwards. Well, if they're coming against God, if they're coming against God's people, to be turned backwards, in a literal sense, would be the word repent. He's, he's praying for them to repent from what they've been doing, from what they've been participating in. He's praying that their shame, their guilt, would be so heavy that the Lord would open their eyes for them to clearly see where they have gone astray and that they would be turned backwards from the way that they've been living. So instead of working against God, they would be turned backwards and now they're working for God. He's praying for their salvation. Take a look at verses 6 and 7. Let them be like the grass on the housetops, which withers before it grows up, with which the reaper does not fill his hand, nor the binder of sheaves his arms. Now, this is where context really matters, because in that time, they didn't build a roof like this, where we have a slope to it. The roof was flat, and they had logs that ran across, and they would kind of fill the gaps with sticks, and then they would layer mud over the top of it. But a lot of times they would use that housetop for storage or sometimes the wind would blow and they would either store seed up there or wind from the field would blow in and seed would make it on the roof. And there would be this small harvest that would grow on the roof, but there was a problem. You see, on the roof there's, there's not enough nutrients for a large harvest. There's not enough depth of soil to hold moisture when the sun is high and bright. And so the ground would dry out quickly, and it would all wither and die. And we can understand this as a prayer against them, or we can understand this as a prayer against their ways. And being that he starts with them repenting in verse 5, it seems appropriate that he's praying against the ways that they've been living. And so here, what he's really praying is, Lord, keep their afflictions towards your people limited. Instead of allowing them to have a large harvest of affliction upon us where the seed will multiply and be planted again and multiply and be planted again, Lord, make it more like the housetop where it will wither and die and it won't be able to have lasting impact from this time forward. Where they are plotting against your people, Lord, strike down their plans. Then we come to verse 8. Nor do those who pass by say the blessing of the Lord be upon you. We bless you in the name of the Lord. You see, he's praying that the Israelites would not feel tempted or compelled to pray for blessing from, from the Lord to come down on those who are enemies of the Lord. Don't pray for blessing for those who are persecuting Israel. Blessing is appropriate. Praying for blessing is appropriate. And that is from a brother and a sister in Christ to another. That is something that should be done. But what he's saying is, Lord, when they come against me with a whip, when, when I don't want them to beat me, and I, and I want to maybe have a little bit of a relaxed affliction instead of an aggressive affliction, don't let me try to bless them to lessen the blow that they might strike against me. Don't let me pray for them in a way where now they feel special and I've built them up. No, no, no. He's saying, Lord, give me clarity. Give me clarity from what is actually right and what is actually wrong. Don't allow me to enter into a form of praying for people who are against you when it's not appropriate, when it's not what you have. Help me, in other words, to understand your righteousness and to live it out rather than to give in to convenience. So the heart of the psalmist in these four verses, the second half of Psalm 129, 
is, is kind of this in modern language. Lord, show them the depths of their wickedness, allowing their shame to cause them to turn away from their sin and toward you. Lord, don't allow their affliction on your people to be multiplied. Keep their affliction limited in scope. And Lord, help us to discern right from wrong as you do. It's a deliberate turn towards the Lord. It's having accepted the pain that this is the reality we're in and bringing it to the Lord in prayer. Being intentional to come before his throne regardless of the context that they're facing. In 1873, there's a story of a man that I'm sure many of you are familiar with. His name was Horatio Spafford. And he was from New York, and, and he started a law firm, and he moved to Chicago, and the law firm grew quickly, and there was lots of business at hand, and there was a wave of evangelism that was taking place in Europe. And being a strong believer, being someone who's engaged in his church, who loves the Lord, he and his family wanted a time to step away from the business of the law firm, a time of respite, a time to be together, but also a time to be intentional for the Lord. That this time wasn't going to just be vacation. This time was going to be, we're going to go serve the Lord. We're going to go preach the gospel in Europe, and we want to be a part of what God is doing there. And so at the last minute, some business issues rose up, and Horatio had to stay behind, and he sent his family on ahead in his plan was to meet up with them shortly. But the ship wrecked. It collided with another ship in the middle of the ocean, and Maggie and Bessie, Annie, Tanetta, all of his daughters, drowned. On November 22nd of 1873, he received this telegram from his wife that said, Saved alone, what shall I do? Upon receiving this devastating news, Horatio got on a boat and he sailed across the ocean. And as he came up to the, the approximate area of where the shipwreck had happened, he was compelled to write a hymn, a hymn that reflected much of the same sentiment that we find in Psalm 129. This is how it reads, when peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. You know, despite the immense personal loss that Horatio and Anna faced, they continued to trust in God. They continued to trust in his plans for their life. What's hard about their story, which a lot of people don't know, is that the suffering wasn't done. They actually had three more kids, and at the age of four, their son died of scarlet fever. You see, we don't know what context is around the corner for our life. We know what we're living today. We're able to look back and claim what God has done in the past. We know that he's walking with us as believers and that we can be committed to him because we've seen him at work again and again and again. But when that pain comes, that indescribable loss, how do we respond to the pain? How do we live out a life before the Lord where it seems that we're just suffering day after day and we can't see the light at the end of this long, dark, damp tunnel. You know, it's, it's when we learn to run to God in every context and at every corner that we begin to enter in to a deeper, more purposeful life that he has called us to. It's not that we're unfazed by the pain. 
But it's when we've made a habit of running to him again and again and again and again and again, day after day, no matter what. I'm bringing the Lord with me wherever I go. That when the pain comes, I, I can honestly turn towards the Lord and say, Lord, there's been times of peace like a river. And there's been times of sorrows where the sea billows just rolled over me again and again. But Lord, you are good. Lord, you are righteous. It is well with my soul because I know you. And I know that you have invited me into eternity with you. If you haven't accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I want to challenge you this morning. That cutting of the cords of the wickedness it's what Jesus did for us on the cross. It's how he went before us. It's how he has provided for us to have life everlasting with him. We're told in Revelation that there will be no more crying, no more pain, no more tears. That the former things have passed away. And it will be a time of just being able to live out the joy of the Lord, and to be in his presence, to be filled by who he is constantly. And to just stand in awe and reverence of him and to spend eternity in a place that is far better than we can imagine. So whatever your context is today, know that there is life beyond this one. And Jesus provides it for us, for any who would come to him. And his longing is that none should perish. Are you willing to turn to the Lord today? And for those of you who are believers, do you recognize the, the promise of Psalm 34, 18 and 19, where it says, the Lord is near to the brokenhearted. He saves the crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. You see, a life with Christ is a life of knowing that we have preservation. It's a life of knowing that we will find deeper fulfillment in our sorrow rather than having to grieve it in a way that is despairing. Instead, it can help us grow as people to find greater depth and for allow him to truly have his way with us as we say, Lord, even today, even when everything has gone astray, uh, you, are, you are worthy, you are righteous, and I'm going to seek you with all that I have. Let's close the service today by praying together. Lord, we thank you for this morning and we thank you for the time that we've had to study your righteousness, to consider that we don't have to try to answer that, that question of whether or not you are truly righteous. But from reading your word, we see it again and again. From our own life experiences, people who have put our faith and trust in you, we've seen how you've been faithful to us again and again and again. Lord, I pray for, for this body here I pray that you would help them to long to come together as your family, to long to live out missionally your kingdom. In whatever context they're in, Lord, I pray that you would embolden them, that you would give them encouragement, that you would give lift to their souls, and that today you would remind them that you are the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the one who is worthy and the one who will bring them into eternity with yourself. Lord, you are the giver of life, and we praise you, and we thank you for how charitable you are toward us. We commit ourselves to you in your name. Amen.